Hello and welcome everyone. I am Amar and in this video I am going to present 10 important questions on metal poisoning and the metal that we are going to discuss are thallium, cadmium, barium and zinc. So without any further delay, let's move to the question number one. So question number one states that what unusual characteristics may urine exhibit in thallium poisoning? And here are the options. It may be green, it may be pink, it may be a floral scented with pink coloration and option four it may be dark red color due to hemolytic anemia and the correct answer for this question is option first that is it may be green and it is usually seen when the concentration of thallium is greater than 40 microgram per deciliter per deciliter in blood and 150 microgram per liter in urine so the color of the green in urine is usually seen when the concentration of thallium in blood uh, is more than 40 microgram per deciliter and in urine its concentration is more than 150 microgram per liter. Now let's move to the question number second. So question number second says a rapid quantitative urine test for thallium using sodium bismuth solution indicates. First, green color precipitate. Option second, red color precipitate. Option third, yellow color precipitate, and option four, boric crystals with prismatic shapes. And the correct answer for this question is option second, that is red color precipitate. So to perform this quantitative urine test for thallium, the three main ingredients are first, 0.4% of sodium bismuth in 20% nitric acid. Second ingredient or reagent is 10% sodium iodide. And third is the suspected sample. Suspected sample of UV. So by mixing 0.4% sodium bismuth in 20% nitric acid and 10% sodium iodide with suspected sample of urine, uh, red precipitate is formed. And this indicates that the thallium is present in the urine. Now let's move to the question number third. Question number third states that what is the characteristics of thallium exposure in hair? And here are the options. First is the greenish blue pigmentation close to the hair root. Option second, brownish black pigmentation close to hair root. Option third, bright red pigmentation close to hair root. And option fourth, whitening of hair similar to aging. And the correct answer for this question is option second, that is brownish black, black pigmentation close to hair root. And this usually occurs at the third or fourth day of post exposure of thallium. And the test usually done microscopically, microscopically. So the hair is applied. So hair is applied with 10% solution of sodium hydroxide, that is NaOH. So after observing under microscope, there are the dark bands, dark bands close to the root and which may appear uh, brownish black. So, for example, let's say here is a root or here is the hair. So, here close to the root, there are the dark bands or dark brownish bands, dark brownish bands. And these bands are usually appear after third and fourth day of exposure by thallium. Now, let's move to the question number four. Question number four states that what treatment form insoluble iodide salt of thallium? And here are the options. First, Stomach wash with 1% sodium and potassium iodide solution. Option second, stomach wash with 5% sodium and potassium iodide solution. Option third, so, uh, stomach wash with 1% sodium and potassium bismuth solution. And option four, stomach wash with 5% sodium and potassium bismuth solution. And the correct answer for this question is option first, that is stomach wash with 1% sodium and potassium iodide solution. So the correct answer is option first. And here, there are two main terms that are included or listed in the options. 
first is the stomach wash that is also known as gastric lavage and second is the uh, salt that is 1% sodium or potassium uh, solution. So this procedure serves two main things. First, it removes it removes thallium from stomach and second, the 1% sodium or potassium iodide solution converts thallium. So it converts thallium into iodide salt. And this iodide salt is usually insoluble, insoluble, which means it is less deadly absorbed by the body, absorbed by GIT or the intestine. So when a person is suffering from thallium poisoning, then in that case, the medical interventions are gastric lavage, that is stomach wash, followed by or with 1% solution of sodium and potassium iodide. Now, let's move to the question number five. So question number five states that what is the use of thallium 201 in clinical practice? So thallium 201 is a, is a radioactive tracer. So it is uh, used as a radioactive tracer. And it is usually used for myocardial perfusion. Imaging. So, thallium or TL201 is used as a radioactive tracer in myocardial perfusion imaging. And this myocardial perfusion imaging is also known as thallium stress test. Stress test. And another name is her centrography. G R A T H U. So this is an imaging test uh, to assess the blood flow, to assess the blood flow in heart muscles, in heart muscles. And it is usually done in three steps. And the first step is the injection, injection with TL201. So person is injected uh, with uh, thallium 201. Thallium 201 behaves as a potassium, as a potassium ion, and it is taken by the healthy perfused myocardial cells. And after that, a gamma, a gamma camera is employed over the heart. So what this gamma camera do is that it activates or captures the radio, radioactive, radioactive emission. From TL201. So let's say the first scenario in which the there is a normal blood flow, then there will be the normal thallium intake for TL201 emission is normal and usually seen with a normal blood flow. And in second scenario, let's say there is a blockage. Let's say there is a blockage. Then in that case, the emission from the thallium 201 is reduced or has a defect and it is usually uh, seen as a cold spot. So in case of healthy, there is a normal intake of the thall uh, thallium 201, but in case of, for example, there is a reduced blood flow or a blockage, then there is a cold spot or there is a defect in the normal lining of the or normal emission uh, from the thallium 201. So here is the process uh, of uh, how thallium 201 is used uh, for the clinical purposes and for how it is used uh, to check whether there is a, a regular flow of blood in heart muscles or not. Now let's check the options. So option first that is as a radioactive tracer in photodynamic therapy for the cancer treatment. This is wrong. Moving to the second option that is as a radio tracer in heart centrography and this is the correct answer. So for this, the option second is the correct answer. Now let's move to the question number six. The question six says the term ethai ethai disease is associated with. So ethai ethai is a Japanese term, and in English it means ouch ouch, ouch ouch, and it is associated with a condition of cerve pain, cerve pain in bones and joints and as the case gets worsened the bones become too weak 
that it result in weak bones that can get easily injured. So, ethyl thigh disease is also called as ouch ouch in English, or it is a condition that characterized by the soft pain in bones and joint as well as the weakened bones that lead to fracture. So, the ethyl thigh term is associated with the outbreak in Japan. So, it associated with the outbreak in Japan in 1946, and the cause of this uh, disease is the chronic. Chronic cadmium poison, and this is majorly, or this was majorly due to the contamination of food and water from the mining discharge. So, ethyethy is a disease that is associated with the chronic cadmium poisoning, and it is first uh, seen in the case of outbreak that was in Japan 1946 due to the consumption of contaminated food and water that was discharged from the mining. So now let's check the options. So option first is the barium poisoning, uh, which is incorrect. Moving to the option second, that is cadmium poisoning, which is correct because the thigh thigh disease that I already told you that it is due to the chronic cadmium poisoning. So what does the chronic mean? Chronic means small doses or several doses over a long period of time. Long period or of time, or you can say extended period of time. So for this, the option second is the correct answer. Now let's move to the question number seven. Question number seven says, what is the primary use of barium sulfate in medical practices? And here are the options. First is for the MRI examination of GIT. Option second for the X-ray examination of GIT. Option third as an antibiotic. And option fourth is both first and second. And the correct answer for this question is option second that is for X-ray examination of GIT. So barium sulfate is used uh, for medical practice for X-ray examination of GIT and it is also referred as barium mean. Barium mean. And apart from this barium mean, there are two more uh, terms. First is barium. First is barium swallow. And second is barium. Barium enema. So, barium meat, as I already told you, is usually used for the examination of GIT or intestine or small intestine. And in case of barium swallow, it is usually used uh, for the examination of pharynx, pharynx, and esophagus. And talking about the barium enema, so barium enema is usually used for examination of large intestine. Which includes rectum and colon. So here are the three main use of barium sulfate. Uh, for example, first is for as a barium bean, a second is barium swallow, and third is for barium enema. And all these are with, uh, related to the extra examinations of different body parts. So now check why barium sulfate is used uh, for extra examination. So barium sulfate has a high atomic mass so what this uh, atomic mass or atomic number do that it makes this barium sulfate opaque so when a person ingested barium sulfate suspension so it get coated the lining of the uh, GIT and provide a clear contrast x-ray image so it makes uh, image of the x-ray to appear clear and contrast now let's move to the question number eight and question number eight state that what are the other names of metal fume fever MFF except so what is metal fume fever so metal fume fever is associated with the occupational illness so it is a type of occupational occupational illness and it is mostly due to the inhalation inhalation of metal oxides so, metal fume fever is an occupational illness that is occupational illness that is due to the inhalation of metal oxides. So, now let's check the options. First is the Welter fever and MFF is also called as Welter fever because it is due to the inhalation inhalation of fumes during welding. So, 
This is a term that is associated with MFF. Moving to the option second, that is Brastil. It is also the term that is associated with MFF and it defines the inflation of fumes uh, from the heated pass. So when the fumes from the heated pass is inhaled, then it causes brass steel. And as you know, brass is also known as a mixture of copper and zinc. So option second can't be the correct answer because it's a except. Now let's move to the option third that is Monday morning fever and it is the another term that is used for MFF or metal fume fever and this is usually uh, represent the symptoms that appears on Monday or first day back to work. So now let's take an example of a worker A that works from Monday to Friday. So he works from Monday to Friday and exposed to the uh, metal fumes or metal oxide fumes and takes a break of uh, Saturday, Sunday. So when he again comes on Monday, then he again exposed to the metal oxides or metal oxide fumes. And th in that case, he may have some uh, headache or fever. And this is why it is also known as Monday morning fever. So option three can't be correct for this. Now let's move to the fourth that is Kiatin flushes. And this is the correct answer because I have made this term. So this is nothing or it doesn't relate anything. So the correct answer for this question is option four that is Kiatin flushes. Apart from this, there are two more names of metal fume fever or MFF. First is smelter, smelter fever. And second is foundry fever. So with that, this question is ended. Now let's move to the question number nine. That is, dash is used to convert barium into insoluble compound, aiding removal from bond. So what is added or given to a patient to remove the barium and make it insoluble to GIT? Now let's take a look on the options. Option first is sodium sulfate. Option second is sodium phosphide. Option third is barium carbonate. And option fourth is zinc phosphide. And the correct answer for this question is option first, that is sodium sulfate. So when the sodium sulfate reacts with barium, so when it reacts with barium, then it gets converted into barium sulfate, barium sulfate, and which is insoluble to GIT. So this means it is not absorbed by intestines, intestines, and get easily uh, excreted out from the body. So it leads to the excretion of barium and reduce the uh, symptoms from barium poisoning. So the correct answer for this is option first that is sodium sulfate. Now let's move to the question number 10 that is what unique characteristics does vomitus have when the zinc phosphide poisoning occurs and here are the options. First it is colorless and odorless. Second it has a sweet smell and third it gives smell of garlic and option four it is highly acidic. And the correct answer for this question is option third that is, that is it gives a smell of garlic. So this uh, smell of garlic is due to the release of phosphine gas. Phosphine gas or PH3. Which is due to the reaction of zinc phosphide with the acid of stomach. And this combination that is the zinc phosphide plus acid or HCl of stomach releases phosphine gas and this phosphine gas has a characteristics of garlic smell garlic smell so the correct answer for this question is option third that is it gives the smell of garlic and that this presentation is ended and thank you for being watching till now and uh, i hope you have subscribed our channel and if you haven't subscribed please subscribe our channel and thank you because we have uh, just crossed the 2k subscribers so thank you and i will meet you in the next video Till then, be healthy and do some exercises both mentally and physically and keep studying.